Hi, folks. This is Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com, thechrisvossshow.com. Hey, we're coming here with another great podcast. We certainly appreciate you, not you, 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 no, all of you. Uh, we, we love all of you. We appreciate all you guys tuning in, but you, especially in the back there, the one listening, the one, yep, yep, I got your attention, you. We appreciate you the most. So anyway, guys, uh, thanks for showing up to the show. We certainly appreciate that. We've got a most wonderful guest on. She's been on before, so this will be her second time. She's vying for the SNL uh, Chris Foss show robe, I think, at this point, because, you know, I don't know when you get I think you get a five appearances or something. So anyway, she shares some wonderful data with us, and uh, we'll get into that here again on how you can change your life, especially in what's going on right now in today's financial world. Uh, but in the meantime, go to thecvpn.com, subscribe to online podcasts, go to youtube.com forward slash Chris Voss. And there's a secret video that's featured in the front of me about five years ago visiting a burger place with a, I don't know, was it two foot tall burger or some crap? And uh, everything else and some of the entertaining we did, it's probably one of the most watched, well, it's one of the most watched videos on the channel. So if you haven't gone there, you should just go subscribe just for that reason alone to watch Chris Voss eat a giant two foot tall sandwich or something that and I also get spanked at the end it's a tourist trap I know it sounds weird because it's in Vegas but it's not anyway guys uh go watch the video on YouTube and subscribe to the channel it's featured it's not secret uh so we appreciate you guys being here today we have again Amira Alvarez she's the founder and CEO of the Unstoppable Woman it's in a coaching global company that's helping entrepreneurs, empire builders, athletes, creatives, and rising stars in all fields, every single field there is, achieve their dreams and goals in record time. She's someone who made a quantum leap going from six figures to making 700K in one year, then going on to seven figures. And she's lived to tell about it. Not many people come back from that. She knows exactly what tactical strategies and mindset shifts are required to get out of your own way, live your own life on your own terms, and master the art of achieving any goal you set your mind to. Welcome to the show again, Al Amira. How are you doing? I am awesome. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thanks for uh, coming back to the show. We certainly appreciate the uh, you being on prior. Everyone who hasn't got a chance to do that can go to the Chris Foss Show and Google Amira's name, Amira Alvarez, and you can find her previous thing. And uh, she's one of those people that we give a nod to, like Carson did at the end of the show, where we go, we'd love to have you on again. And we don't tell that to everybody. <laughs> um, so there you go. But uh, Amira, how have you been doing since uh, the podcast that you were on? You know, pretty damn well, given current events and the crazy <laughs> in the world. The world um, burning down, you're doing pretty damn good. All right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the protests, the uh the political fallout, the I don't know, it seems like it seems like 20 I remember when I got to the end of 2019, everybody posted like I think I posted something the next day. It's it was a meme that said let's never talk about 2019 ever again. But I'll take 2019 back. You know, you know when you break up with a lover and you know you're like they're really horrible and then you go date somebody who's even worse and then you're like calling your old lover back going hey um can we get back together because uh <laughs> uh i didn't I, I guess i just really didn't appreciate you enough <laughs> here's here's the thing there's gonna be some friggin' silver lining from all of this we're we're all gonna get like to the other side and it's gonna be better even the social justice stuff which is just like freaking atrocious mm -hmm. and it's really good that it's come to the freaking surface and it's being dealt with on a whole new level like that's positive and it's a lot to deal with for yeah, everyone it is yeah. it is a lot but i guess change can be difficult uh it can be challenging it's and can be painful but you're right when we get to the other side of change uh hopefully we change for the better if we've learned our lessons appropriately <laughs> and learned yeah. them right all right, Amira, so uh, tell us where people can find you on the interwebs and what you have coming up. Absolutely. So you can find me at theunstoppablewoman.com. And we have a couple of things that people might be interested in joining me for. Something called the Freedom Equation, which is a free training that we have. That's at theunstoppablewoman.com slash freedom dot dash equation. So freedom dash equation. 
And in that free training, we are taking people through how to become a center of your own wealth creation and the entire freedom equation, how they do that step by step. It is action packed and content filled. And then the second thing that we have coming up is a virtual summit called Accelerate Freedom. And it's taking this content to the next level so that you can create a full success plan for yourself to get you from where you are now to the financial goals that you have, how to become a center of your own wealth creation. Awesome sauce. So let's get into some of the details here as we go through it. Right now we're going through a lot of different things. So the Federal Reserve is um, saying that, uh, you know, we're going to be in this for the long haul. There's a a word from the administration. They're not going to shut the economy down. We're seeing uh, the rise of of COVID-19 across about 21 states right now. We really haven't seen uh, the fall from the economy. In fact, uh, uh, yesterday, the uh, markets finally realized the economy is broken and it's not coming back. And we saw these bounces uh, actually before the 2008. I still have friends that are in the stock market trading. And we saw this FOMO sort of effect where even though the economy was crashing, the stock market was still like people just not giving it up. I also saw this in the dot-com era when I used to day trade on NASDAQ. Um, where after the dot-com crash, like people were still going into the market and still trying to, you know, hit it. I mean, back then you could make 50 grand in like 20 minutes um, hitting just dot-coms that were being launched on the market, uh, Earthlink and uh, Worldcom and, you know, all Net, Netscape um, and all those things. But uh, now, you know, we're still seeing that starting to go. So we haven't seen the bankruptcies hit yet, but there's a point where the market finally goes, uh, crap, this is over. And we're, we saw 1.5 million people file for unemployment yesterday. Um, fortunately, those numbers are quite down quite a bit from what they were. And some people are getting rehired, but there's 40, I think it's 44 million people unemployed right now. That's pretty, that's pretty crazy. So, uh, we brought Amira on to talk about some programs that she's, uh, doing and some advice that she has to people out there who need financial advice and want to know how to, you know, I, I've talked about this before where this is a great time to reinvent yourself and rebuild yourself uh, when you got to start over, when you lose work, when you lose your jobs. So, um, uh, Amir, give me some of your thoughts on on what's going on right now and, and what you guys are doing to help people with that. Yeah. So, I just want to be fully transparent. I am not the economist. I am not the expert in macro economy and how that works. Okay. So I'm raising my hand. I'm copping to that. That's not my area of specialty. What I, what I help people with is being the center of their own wealth creation, being the center of their own economy, which, which means to me, knowing how to have certainty, certitude over your economic well being, your economic situation. And this is something that we weren't taught in schools. At least I wasn't taught at all how to take the, the world that we're living in, the chaos that seems like there's all this stuff happening outside of ourselves, right? There's COVID, the stock market, all of this outside circumstance that's affecting the economy. And it could be your own personal economy, right? Like you work for a company and they're laying people off or uh, your boss just gets mad at you, not, not anything to do with the economy and, and says you're fired, right? Oh, that you sounds know? like my whole career. Yeah, until you started working for yourself, right? <laughs> yeah. Then, then you're like, okay, my way. I understand how this works. I fire but, myself daily though. I'm like, you're fired. And I'm like, you can't fire me. I'm the boss. And I'm like, you're still fired. It's, it's a so when thing. you say you fire yourself daily, do you mean like this idea that like you can do better, like holding yourself to a higher <clears throat> standard? No, I'm just sick of me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Cause I think that there's like, I know there's better employees out there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think there's that fire up concept, right? Yeah, that's like, true. Yeah. You know, like fire your fire yourself from doing the job that someone else can actually do better, but you there are you stubborn go. about holding on to because you think you have to, for some reason, that is a sure way to keep yourself from growing. So fire up, right? Like mm. you get to do your genius work and hire someone who's better at that than what you, how you do it. Yeah. Now I can validate that some of the times in my business where I've held on to some things that I should delegate, 
um, really stunted the growth in our business and really impacted us and held back. And there were some cases on a, on a small scale, I could do it better, but there is just a point where it needs to get handed off to people and they may not be able to do as good as you, but they can do more of it. I mean, it can be their number one focus where as an entrepreneur or CEO, your focus has got to be blended to so many different things out there. Yeah, there's some sort of diminishing returns there when you yeah, do everything that's yourself. That's a good point. That's a good way to say yeah. it. Diminishing returns. Don't the delegate. Don't diminishing return. Yeah. And that's that's usually what it became. So And I think there's there's like this place where there's fire up and fire because you just fire yourself, fire up, right? Mm. And you actually have to hire someone who's better at what you do, right? You have to hire the expert. Mm -hmm. And then there's other jobs where it's the little, they're, they're smaller, littler things. And it, that person, you might need five of you to fill that one role because you're actually, you got that thing dialed in, but it's not, it's still not the best use of your time. Yeah. Right. And, and it might take five people to do that. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, if you don't, you're still holding yourself back. Yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah. And, and that's really important for people to know when they're starting businesses and stuff. I mean, you, there's points where you have to ask yourself, do I need, need to delegate or hire somebody else? And a lot of people fight against it because they're like, well, that's money in my pocket. But they don't understand that, that you know, the, the power of getting, I remember when we hit 100 employees, I was like, this is awesome, man. I got everybody to do all these things and they do all this stuff. And I just sit in my office and, uh, I don't know, mix, uh, what, what the hell was I mixing at the time? I don't know. I had a nice bar in my office back in the day. Uh, <laughs> I think it was JD or it was, uh, no, a Scotch whiskey. It was, uh, it was the famous Scotch whiskey from the Steely Dan song, I think. Anyway, a um, <laughs> little side note there, a little side, a little footnote for people on the podcast. So I have a question about whiskey for you. Can okay. I answer you a whiskey question? Have sure. you tried Conor McGregor's? I believe so. Oh, Conor McGregor, uh, the, the wrestler? Yeah. No. Yeah, he has a whiskey line. Have you tried it? Proper no. 12? 12 no. proper, proper 12. Is there a joke here coming? No, just curious. I was just I was looking for a punchline. Get it? No, punch. no punchline. No. Like, is it good? Have you tried it? <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't want to bleed out the mouth. I don't know. The, uh, I don't know. Conor McGregor, man. That guy's something else. Um, he so, retired. So you guys are working on a program uh, that you guys are holding coming up, right? Um, where you guys are talking about some different ways of how to do your own wealth creation, economic freedom. Uh, what does that sort of thing mean, economic freedom and, and uh, your own wealth creation? I mean, is that where I'm copying money, printing it off my Xerox machine? No, because that would be unethical. That would be illegal. Yeah. Don't do that. Uh, don't do that. It's, it's really, here's the thing. Fundamentally, I teach how do you achieve a goal? Like how do you take something from an idea and make it manifest? Like have it be in this 3D world where you can touch it, use it, experience it. Money is just like that. Wealth is just like that. It's taking the idea, your goal of where you want to be financially and how do you actually create it in this world? And if you understand that creative process for money, which touches everything in your life, okay? Ask me, ask me about that if you want, because like some people are like, no, no, money doesn't touch everything, but it freaking does in some tangential way. And That's so true. if you don't have control over your wealth creation, over how to create money, mm -hmm. you will always feel like the world is happening to you. You insecure that you have to jump through hoops for other people and, and contort yourself really. Okay. Yeah. And to me, that's not freedom. Okay. It's just, isn't. So if you know how to do this and you can do it with certainty and consistency and you in, understand it both intellectually, but also like tangibly, like, you know, how, what actions to take, then you've got freedom and then it's just put it on freaking repeat and go again and again and again. It definitely is. I mean, I've worked for myself since I was 18. I've uh, worked from home since 2004. Um, just being able to have the freedom to do what I want. And I have a lot of friends that I hang out with, uh, you know, I don't have a wife and kids. So, you know, my play dates are friends on video games. So I have a lot of friends. We play video games. And of course we have a huge video game <clears throat> 
podcasts and empire and stuff like that. Um, so we have a lot of influence in the uh, video game review products that we do, but uh, it's funny because my friends will be like, Oh man, Chris, I got to get off and go to work. What are you going to do today? I'm like, I don't know. I might play some video games and then maybe do a podcast or two. And I don't know. I might just screw around today. <laughs> do what I want. <laughs> yeah. And that's your choice. I mean, you could be doing something else, right? I mean, but that's your choice. You have yeah. the freedom. It's just like, that. it's just like, I'll, I'll sit and go like, I don't know what, what do I want to do today? Do what I want. And that's yeah. the beauty of financial freedom is being able to do what you want. If I want to go be creative, if I want to work on my book. If I want to work on some different business plans or some different ways to make some money, or deals that I want to take and do, then I can, I can go do that, but I have the yeah. freedom. And like, there's no one that says, Hey, you got to show up. I mean, I have to show up for the podcast. We have guests, oh, the wonderful guests like you on, uh, but I'll say it. You got to show up. You got to show up for those. <laughs> okay. But the rest of the day, I'm going to probably go screw around. It's Friday. <laughs> yeah. The other thing that like, we were talking politics before the, 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 we started recording. And mm -hmm. the other thing that money gets you to gives you right. The option mm -hmm. to do is like, you get to decide, what campaigns you give to, what charities, what foundations, where mm -hmm. you're like, when you, you can decide, you don't have to buy from the least expensive uh, company. You can put your money where, oh, I like their politics. I'm going to buy from over here. You and you're not worried about running out of money. Hell, if you have enough money, you can just start your own foundation. And Correct. It. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, money is, uh, uh, some people say money is the root of all evil. I, I, I grew up, you know, with my parents and a lot of parents that would always say, you know, you, you'd run to them at the checkout stand. You'd be like, hey, mommy, can we buy this box of cereal? And she's like, we don't have enough money. And that was just her way of just getting rid of you. Uh, you know, she didn't want to buy the, the, the bag of sugar, you know, nasty cereal yeah. that was going to have you, uh, you know, bouncing off the walls at home she didn't want to deal with that and i can't blame her um but a lot of people would would say this thing well we don't have enough money and that became a thing and a lot of people kind of mirror this from their own parents and if you watch uh, tony robbins all the way back to um i don't know think or grow rich um just about every positive uh, person has talked about how some of these different rules that we make in our head or kind of um uh, records that we play over and over again um, kind of put us in these self-limiting, uh, scotomas where we, where we, um, you know, we don't, we, we think of money as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, I don't know, handicapped as opposed to a tool that can be used. Well, fundamentally it's a way of being a slave to something as opposed mm -hmm. to having it serve you, have it being a resource, yeah. right? And in, in the way we are brought up, I know I was brought up this way. Okay. I'm not, I didn't come out of this world with a good money mindset, like, but I had to learn it because mm -hmm. I was really limited in thinking how I thought about money. And then it just kept self-creating over and over and over again until I was able to figure out what these blind spots were and start a different creative process so that I was thinking differently about it so that I could create differently in my actions and results. Yeah. And it's phenomenal. It definitely makes a difference. My father used to do a thing. He drove, he drove VWs and this is back in the day when VWs had first been brought over from uh, Germany. Was it a and VW van or a bug? It was or all of them. He had like yeah. two vans and then the station wagon yeah. Like he was in on it. And then when Subaru came, he was trying to sell them all so he could buy one of the Subarus. Yeah. We, knew we had a VW van growing up. It Did was you so really? much fun. Yeah. Oh I was like, I was a little one and I had the <laughs> sleeping thing over the uh, two front seats, right? There yeah. was the, yeah. Yeah. I, was, I got tucked up in there. <laughs> My dad had the bare bones one that was kind of like a truck. It, was, it wasn't a truck where it had a back, but it was just like bare bones. And yeah. he used to, it was funny. He, he, uh, he owned a delivery route. Like you could buy a franchise of a newspaper coin op delivery route in mm -hmm. LA. And so we, you know, we'd pull up to the, I, I'd sit in the back and be reading the comics and he'd pull up to the, the coin op on the corner in LA downtown. <clears throat> I jump out, you know, lift the, 
lift the if <laughs> those are millennials and gen yeah. y's or x's you're gonna have to look like what are you doing yeah. <laughs> but you lift it up you you pull out the old papers so the new papers in clean the change boom you know dance around the drunks on the on the ground and then hop in the van and you you go around and that was actually a thing like he bought a franchise of that which is huh. just like you don't you're just like what like yeah. that was you know this was by in a subway back then or something that's um, fascinating. Like I always thought those were managed by the LA Times or whatever the newspaper was, but they sold yeah. franchises. Yep. They sold franchises no for the for the for the area. And that was your yeah. like that was your area you owned. You own those things and you have to service them. And you know, then we go back to the newspaper uh lot and you know, we'd have lunch. There'd be like one of those big carts that came in, the big uh oh I forget the vendor trucks that would come in. And so that was the big thing to get vendor food. Uh and, uh, but yeah, that was, that was the thing. And, and I'm trying to remember why we told that story. Oh yeah. So anyway, dad used to, uh, he loved VWs and I, I grew up in Beverly Hills in Hollywood two two blocks from the, um, Chinese theater, which I think is now called, I don't know what it's called this week, the Kodak theater or something else. Um, and we used to walk the dog with Bob Barker. That was a normal life. That was how I grew up was seeing these cars. Uh, and I didn't really understand. I thought we were rich cause my parents, um, uh, uh, managed an apartment in Beverly Hills. So I was, I was in a car apartment complex. So they got rent free. So I, I thought we were doing pretty good too, but my whole life was looking at Bentley's Rolls Royce's, uh, BMW's and Mercedes. <clears throat> and I'd say to my dad, I'd say, dad, how come, uh, that Mercedes is, I, I had really good taste as a child. And I, I'd be like, uh, Hey, how come, uh, that guy has a Mercedes dad? Why don't you get a Mercedes? And he'd be like, cause the bank owns them. <laughs> and I'd just be like, oh, so what does that mean? He goes, well, they owe a lot of money to the bank. They have to pay him. And so for a couple of years, my dad got away with that excuse on me. And I'd be like, oh, there goes the bank on people. But I still like BMWs and Mercedes. And then one day I asked him, because I was like, well, what does it mean the bank on them? Well, they make payments to the bank. And I'm like, well, so you don't make payments to the bank on this car, dad? <laughs> and he goes, well, the other thing. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, and he goes, he goes, no, it's not the same thing. But yeah, the, I mean, the bank owns this too. And I'm like, wait, hold on. So I can have either or? Why do I, why would I, why are these people choosing Mercedes when my dad's choosing a BMW when the bank's going to own it either way? What's the basic? The other thing that's like loopy, inaccurate, blind spot in that is, oh, guess what? You just leverage someone else's money. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like people, I have to coach my clients and I used to have to coach myself on this, change my mindset on this. It's like, what is, what is having credit card, a credit card loan, right? Mm -hmm. Or what is a business loan or what do you think companies when they sell stock are doing? It's, it's public debt. They're leveraging, yeah, leveraging other people's money. When you have a, a, a business loan, you're leveraging other people's mo money. It's okay to do this for a mortgage, right? Mm -hmm. But people don't, people don't think about it for their own personal life in terms of cars. Like that's for some reason frivolous or for your business. Mm -hmm. Like what if you actually wanted to grow your business and you needed investment? Mm -hmm. Right. And then people get all wonky about, oh my God, I owe all of this money. Well, if you thought about that it was an investment and that you were leveraging it and you were paying X percent on the 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 money and that you were gonna make more than that X percent, that's a really good, that's a great math equation right there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Now, if you don't make good on your your business, that's not a great math equation, <laughs> you know. <laughs> But I mean, debt is, debt is good and, and leverage is good if you can, if you can turn that around and get a return on investment. I mean, that's really what you have to take a look at and how it works. So why do some entrepreneurs uh, not really have economic freedom, even when they make lots of money? Well, it's because they haven't figured out their relationship with money. Okay. Mm -hmm. They might have figured out how to make money, which is great. Some people need to start there. I, I certainly, when I was first in business, I needed to start with learning how to make money. Okay. Mm -hmm. Period. Full stop. I needed to understand how that worked and learning sales was a big part of that, but also how to, you know, the business model. Okay. But then after that, you can be someone, you can have a self image in your subconscious of someone who is never going to get ahead. Like if you were brought up 
in an atmosphere where it was deemed appropriate to always be struggling to make money. And that's what you hold in your mind as being a good person and working hard. Then you're going to keep recreating that over and over again. It doesn't matter how much money you make. You're always going to be spending more playing this shell game. How many entrepreneurs do you know? I know I used to do this, right? It was the shell game of like, okay, we're going to do payroll this at this time. And then I'm going to pay this credit card over here. And it's going to do this little thing because I, I didn't know how to be someone who actually made a freaking profit. Okay. <laughs> Right. I could make a lot of money, but I couldn't make a profit. And I, you know, I, if, if you're listening to this and you're an entrepreneur who's in that situation, zero shame. Okay. Like don't make yourself feel bad about that. I would say probably 90% of business owners are in that situation, mm -hmm. but I am making up that number really, but just behind the scenes, I see this a lot. Okay. Yeah. And, and you have to learn, you have to, it's not just learning the outside tactics of, how to manage money or like buying decisions and all of that. It's becoming a person who values themselves enough to make a profit and not have to friggin' struggle. Okay. Does everybody really have the ability to make as much money as you want in your opinion? I think so. I know so. Okay. That's not a thought. That's not a, I, it's a truth. So I don't think some people come into this world with, more of an ability than other people. I think we all have the freaking ability to make as much money as we want. Now, that is not to say that there isn't, you know, systemic structures in place that make it easier for certain people than other people. You know, there's, there's systemic racism, there's systemic sexism, there's poverty that really limits how you see the world and what you think is possible. All of that stuff is real. I'm not discounting that mm -hmm. by any means, <clears throat> but everyone has the ability to make as much money as you, as they want. I mean, you can see people who come from extraordinarily um, hard upbringings, poverty, um, really limited access to resources, you know, from disadvantaged um, ethnic backgrounds. Right. And they, figure some things out. They figure out the creative process. They figure out how to create wealth and they do it. Now, not everyone. Okay. And certainly if you are middle-class and you go to, you, you brought up to go to a good college and you get good grades and you get a good college and you get a solid um, middle-class job, th that trajectory is much uh, more, how do I say it? Like you, you're not going to be in poverty then okay yeah. like it, it's it's you're gonna have a, a a significantly um satisfying result okay it's mm -hmm. not gonna be huge wealth necessarily i actually think it's quite difficult for people who are in uh the middle class sort of like the good enough like they're not in poverty mm -hmm. to have enough urgency to really go to the next level I, i'm speaking from my personal perspective experiential level as well there and you're, you're always busy chasing a job. Like, you know, I mean, when I was, when I was a kid, having a job was hard. And when I've worked with investors on, on projects, um, you know, I've had to be a little bit more show up to the office sort of thing. Um, it's, it's hard because you're, you're, you get, when you get home at the end of the day, you're like, I should work on starting my own business. Um, you don't have any energy for it because yeah. you've worked all day. And it's really hard to make that leap from, from going to working for other people, having a job to doing your own thing. Cause a lot of people just want to tune out at the end of the day and they don't want to do stuff. Um, but that's what separates the people who make that uh, ex exceptional change. Like you talk about, you know, and I the, think, Chris, I think like for a lot of people, I had to wake up to this as a potential. I like, I like for me, it was a very salient moment where I was sitting in a seminar and someone said, you know, you can, you can make your annual income, your monthly income. And I was like, what the frickity frick? Really? <laughs> Are you BSing me? Right. And I was like, okay, I want that. 
I want that. And I had never had that idea before. I didn't know you could do that. Okay. And part of like going from a job to creating your own business, right? If we're talking about that kind of transition and being tired at the end of the day, like you need to have someone who's saying to you, you can F and do this and get hooked by the desire because desire is causative. Desire is the thing that's going to get you to put in that extra effort and to realize your potential and to go for more, right? You, you, otherwise it's like, yeah, I don't really know. Like maybe it can happen. Maybe it can't. Yeah. It's simply empowering. I mean, even like, uh, you know, I've been counseling a lot of people, even when I hit my crash and lost most of our businesses that we built over 20 years, what we thought would be an empire, uh, when it got wiped in 2018, starting over to create a business out of thin air was, was, uh, daunting, uh, to have to redo, but I'd done it before. So I knew how to do it, but you're, you're right. I think a lot of people, they just don't have the mindset, the understanding. They're not aware that it's possible. Um, you know, no one ever sat them down. The, the biggest challenge I see, I see with a lot of people, um, because my employees used to joke, they're like, when Chris Voss has kids, he's going to read them to bed at night out of the wall street journal as to what, you know, stocks did for the day. And they'll be in their little double breasted suits. This is back in the nineties when I used to wear custom tailored double breasted suits and I cared. Really? Uh, <laughs> the, uh, and they're, they're like, Chris's kids will be these little kids that walk around 24 seven. Like, hmm. uh, you know, you, you, prior to political office, you could probably call them little Donald Trump's. Um, but, uh, not anymore. Uh, but, uh, uh, no. And, and so, and so I, I was like, I will never teach my kids to go get a job. And that's a lot of parents, a lot of parents, and I have tried to counsel other parents and they just think I'm out of my mind and they go, and you go, uh, you know, the, their kids go, what should I do, dad? Grow up, go to college, get a job, be a slave yeah. to somebody else for the rest of your life. And there's, there's nothing wrong with getting a job and, you know, feeling a slave, but honestly, you're going to feel enslaved sometimes. So that's on you. <laughs> well, but also it's, it's not real security. You know, parents are coming mm -hmm. from a, a, a place of wanting to help their kids have security in life. Like the, yeah. it's coming from a place of good intention, but they were brought up with beliefs of, you know, even the, the, the 1950s of like, join the, you know, work for the company, stay there, work hard for your, your life and you'll get the pension. Right. Mm -hmm. And now we don't think about that, but we still have this mentality that if you get a good job, you're secure. And we don't realize that you could be fired. You could be laid off. Anything yeah. can happen. Right. Yeah. And Anything can happen. And once you get laid off, then, uh, I mean, with health insurance costs nowadays that are out of control, um, you know, I mean, any, anything can happen. I mean, you're, you're at the whim of, of someone else when you work for someone else. So, and, and you always have this underlining current of fear and insecurity. Like it could be taken away at any moment. Like you mm -hmm. can't really be yourself. You can't <laughs> really speak your mind. You can't really affect change. And it limits you. It's not full self-expression. Now, I think there are people who can, who do well in working for other people and they have, there's a way to, to use this creative process and have security in that world as well, as long as you understand how to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's really important in, in being able to master this. I mean, I was fortunate enough. My dad had a lot of books from Merle Nightingale and, and other uh, people. Um, and so I was able to read him and start his own business and stuff. Uh, what was interesting about my father, he was a great guy. Um, but for some reason, he took all the books that he learned about working hard and everything. And then he decided to join Amway and multi-level marketing places. And there, there are times where multi-marketing be successful if you really work hard, but usually you're still at the whim of someone else. And usually the, what he found was the multi-level marketing companies when, you know, once they started making money would change their commission structure and suddenly he wouldn't be making as much money, but mm -hmm. uh, putting into working hard and owning your own business, that's really the difference. And, uh, instead, he went and worked hard for uh, MLMs and life insurance companies. Uh, you know, he's always chasing this dream of, well, if I work for a life insurance company, you know, I sell some clients and then I get paid residuals forever. Well, it turns out life insurance companies have a thing where if they merge with each other, they cancel out any outstanding commissions that are owed by that company. Tricky, tricky, tricky. And they tend to, uh, they tend to merge a lot probably for that reason alone. Wow. Um, so 
owning your own business and having control is really important is a lesson there. Um, because then you don't have anybody who can fire you. You don't have anybody who can go, we're changing your commissions this week. And you're just like, uh, whatever. And, uh, making it do how you want. So how do you reprogram yourself towards wealth? Yeah. So this is, it's, I don't think it's super, super straightforward and, uh, easy, like just add water, magic sprinkles kind of thing. But I can't order this off Amazon. Is that what you're saying? No, sorry. Damn it. But, but underhanded pitch, we are doing this. Can I, can I pitch this? Go ahead. That's this okay. pitch. It. Okay. So we're doing this virtual summit. It's called Accelerate Freedom. It's June 26th, 27th, 28th. And if you go to the unstoppablewoman.com slash accelerate, you will get information about the summit. And we're going to be going into all of this in more detail, the methodology of how to create wealth and reprogram your subconscious so that you're going towards what you want, not away from it, not self-sabotaging. So Mm -hmm. I think there are a few key pieces to this. You have to understand how your mind works and, and be in control of it. Okay. You have to know how to reprogram your belief structure and your subconscious programming. You have to understand where your self image came from and really see if your self image is in, is in alignment with where you want to go. And then you have to start making decisions from where you want to be instead of where you are now, because Mm -hmm. where you are now is not getting you the results that you (laughs) want to have. And yet, you know, people get stuck in a, in a circular loop. Like, like I can't do that because I haven't done it already. Well, you're not going to get the, the thing that you want until you do the, the new thing. It's not rocket science. And yet we've been brought up to be kind of afraid of our shadow and not take steps towards what we want and, and making, making quick decisions, making decisions from where you want to be. One of the key aspects to really stepping up and, and understanding, you know, how to become someone who is the person who has the business that you want to have. And you bring up a really good point. And, and that's actually been the theme of what we've been talking about all along is, is there's a mentality to making wealth, building wealth, starting your own business that you have to get through. There's a self-actualization that you have to get through. Um, that's what I love about being owning your own business. You have to get self-actualized. You have to get responsible to yourself. You have to, you have to realize some of the hangups that are holding you back some of those mental things like what we talked about where, well, we never had enough money, you know, different excuses people make because sometimes they just don't want to go. I mean, they don't really want to go start a business because it's hard work and they they might have to deal with some of their psychological issues. So talking in your uh, seminar you guys are doing uh, is going to be a real important, it sounds like, to discussing the psychology of uh, being financially successful. Absolutely. So a bunch of the things that you were just talking about are like ringing of truth in my head. I'm like, yes, like this whole idea of personal responsibility, Chris, is just friggin' huge. And yet how I was raised was quite, and, and my parents did the best that they could with what they had and they're great people and I love them and all of that. So like, let's take that as a baseline, but it embedded in this was in their belief system, because it was how they were raised, was like to blame other people and blame things outside of yourself for the situation that you're in. And I had to learn to take 100% personal responsibility for every single result that I was getting, every single one. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, guess what happens? That's why leaders do it. You're not a victim anymore. CEOs do it. Yeah, you're not a victim anymore. You're in control. And and that's a real big driver because you realize that you, you hold the lever to the money printer, if you will. Totally. And it's on such a subtle level. It's like, okay, something's not working right in your business. Are you going to blame your employee or are you going to freaking solve the problem? And by solve the problem, I don't mean do the work yourself. I mm-hmm. mean, okay, how do we create a better system? How do I articulate better? How do I communicate better? How do I hold a higher standard? What standard do I need to hold for myself? Have I made myself clear, right? Like these are all things. And then am I afraid to fire someone? Okay. That's a personal responsibility thing too. I remember I didn't, I didn't use like to firing people. Do you like to fire people now? Uh, Yeah. Usually because they deserve it. 
<laughs> it, 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 because as retribution or because it's no like, they just they just deserve it because yeah. i've spent enough time going you really you really need to stop uh watching you know youtube while you're at work you know stuff like that yeah yeah so you know there and there's cause and effect here okay yeah. and when you learn that when you learn that you're 100 per personally responsible for your results that you are at cause for your results that changes everything if you really take it to heart yeah. and you and you work that at every level and you hold yourself to that higher and higher standard every time i'm like okay now why the, why the frickity frick did that happen right because mm -hmm. because you're in business stuff happens okay oh yeah and life. everything comes stuff out happens. and changes i mean you can be riding along for several years and the model works and everything's great and then something that happens outside in the world and the model changes and suddenly you have to adopt or adapt yeah. and uh and uh yeah i mean there's the creative part of it is the real key because you're constantly put forth with changes and you've got to create everything and then you've got to pass it off delegate it to people and go here do this and, and make it great um and it makes a real big difference so you guys are doing this and you guys are going to talk about several different things about the mentality of of wealth creation uh knowing what you want knowing who you are doing the math close the gap you're going to help people create a plan that sounds like a lot of fun yeah that's the big thing that like the the big 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 outcome for this virtual summit is i want you to understand the intellectual framework of it so that you, you understand so, you know knowledge is important but then we have to apply it so we're going to create a success plan for you which is you're here now you want to be here how do you close the gap how do you get from here to here what's your unique way of doing that and we're going to workshop that and make sure that you walk away if you do all the workshopping throughout the the summit you walk away with an actual success plan for yourself that you can execute on uh you guys are going to help people bring truth to the equation uh give them actionable items and to be unstoppable uh, per your brand the unstoppable woman yeah. um so this is gonna be good are you having it virtually yeah it's virtual because we are in you know COVID COVID land. <laughs> um and you know I don't know if you want to see it, but like the, my, my home is full of AV equipment now. Like we've got <laughs> the, the AV company has yeah. set up like the table, the, like the turntables, right? It's the AV mm -hmm. tables. We've got serious cameras here. We're doing it like we would record a, a lot in person event, but we're doing it virtually. And then we're making it really interactive and engaging because you know, when you're sitting at home and you're in front of a computer screen for a few hours, you need it to be a little bit different. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're doing a ton of breakout sessions, workshopping, um, lots of breaks so that your brain doesn't melt. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I do that to clients time. when I get on the phone with them, I melt their brains and they're like, can we stop now and take a break? And I'm like, okay. I mean, your brains might melt from, like the, the massive reframe that we're going to mm -hmm. be doing, but I don't want them to melt because you're sitting in front of a video camera. Yeah. And you bring up a good point. I mean, it's really important to get into that creative aspect to understand uh, your limitations. Um, I, I'm kind of curious and never really thought about it, but how much of being an entrepreneur is mental ability or agility um, as a, as composed to, um, like uh, for me, I've, I solved a lot of those riddles a long time ago, so I've cleaned them out. So it's been a long time. So for me, I just have the functioning of how to start a business. You know, it's as simple to me as a widget. You take a widget, you market the widget, you put it in production, blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's the, that's the yeah. simplified version of it. But, um, but for a lot of people and even me, when I was young, I had to go through cleaning out all that crap in my brain, all those self-limiting beliefs and, and ideas and stuff. So um, it's really important. And I wonder how much of that is like the first steps of being an entrepreneur. I don't know. I think it's huge, Chris. Mm -hmm. At least for me, it was 90%. Like, like 80, 90% yeah. was like clearing that stuff up, bringing truth, right? Like we were talking about bringing truth to the equation. Making money is a simple math equation. And we have all this stuff that's been 
going in our brains since we were a little kid mm -hmm. about like, it's not okay to ask for money. Sales is bad. Sales is manipulative. Um, making money is evil. It's the root of all evil, right? Like mm -hmm. money doesn't grow on trees. Guess what it does? <laughs> okay. You know, it Just actually does. What is, what is money made out of? Think about that. Oh, okay. well, there you go. I never, wow. I never really thought about that. Yeah. I just thought it was dead presidents, but there's that. <laughs> no. Okay. But it's so, it's so interesting how like all of this stuff, um, like what, what is being nice? Okay. Like people get really caught up in like, I need to be nice. Mm -hmm. And, but what is the definition of nice? Is the definition of nice not selling something to someone because they're they're um they say no initially when your product or service is going to change their life for the better mm -hmm. and will totally radically make their life hugely better you've solved a major problem for them what, what is nice there is nice yeah. saying oh okay fine that's no problem or is nice being like you need to freaking buy this because it's going <laughs> to change your life right yeah yeah Okay. The, um, and, and a lot of people have an aversion to sales. They have an aversion to, uh, you know, I, I went through the sales issue where I didn't understand sales. I thought it was taking advantage of other people. Um, you know, it was kind of hustling to me in a way. I don't, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the word hustle because from my day and age, a hustler was somebody who ripped you off. Uh, okay. these days it seems to have taken on a different connotation a little bit. I'm not sure yeah. if it's fully away from what its origins were, but um, you know, some people feel like you're, you're hustling somebody when really, you know, most, most things about being an entrepreneur is you take something and you make it better and you provide a product or service, uh, for people. I remember Earl Nightingale used to say this, if you can create a product that, that improves the quality of people's lives significantly, they will pay you indirect significant to the value that that gives to their life. And I yeah. remember that being a very powerful statement. I was like, holy crap people pay you. And that's most times what you're doing as an entrepreneur is you're improving on something. You're taking either a company you experience with a bad product and making that product better and that experience better in customer service. Or uh, sometimes you create a widget that's just extraordinarily innovative that no one's seen before, patentable. Sometimes you take something that's already been created and you just add uh, something even more interesting to it. Like one of my, I remember one time I went into Office Max and they had painted uh, painted paper clips. <clears throat> and I was pretty much set in my life. I didn't really know it, but I was pretty much set in my life where I'm like, yeah, paper clips. That's kind of, they've kind of peaked. Feel. They yeah. kind of peaked at the best they could do. You know, they kind of cut some ridges in them to make yeah. them, you know, and I was like, okay, well, I, I'm pretty sure those paper clip things are, you know, they've hit maximum value, but no, somebody came along and they, they painted them it was little stripy colors. And, you know, people like, you know, they like their certain colors. So they want that one. Um, I remember there was a, one of my uh, favorite, uh, female entrepreneur stories was a gal who, um, since more women are single now and more, more women are learning and getting power to do their own, uh, chores and, and stuff around the house. She got tired of going to home Depot and seeing, you know, all the colors and all the products, uh, that are at home Depot are largely marketed towards men. And so she yeah. said, well, the hell with this. I want something that I want to you know, that I want to use. And so she came with a whole line of power tools and, and everything else you'd find at Home Depot that was pink. And so the, you had the drill that was colored pink and, you know, it, it just worked for her. Oh. And it was kind of more designed towards females in the female market, but it was, you know, something they could use around the house to do whatever they were uh, up right. to. Yeah. And so I thought that was brilliant. And those are different ways where you can, where you just take a widget and you create your spin on it and it's your better life. And to me, it's easier to go out people when you and ask them for money and sell stuff when you're, when you realize you're creating that sort of value. Yeah. You have to own your value. Mm -hmm. You have to own your value. You have to own the value of the service or, or product that you have. And a lot of people have a mixed up sense of like, their own self-worth right mm -hmm. like that if you own it you're talking big or if you yeah. own it you're own you're, you're trying to put yourself over someone else but that's not the case it's not true and the law of compensation says you're going to be compensated according to the need for what you do so you have to be solving a problem right okay the need for what you do 
your ability to do it. Are you masterful at it? Are you great at it? Okay. And the difficulty in replacing you. Okay. You're not a commodity. Okay. Okay. So what are you laughing about? I'm laughing about how uh, one of my ex business partners in my business, when we, he was uh, pretty much splitting our, our money and uh, we were taking home uh, a lot of money per month. I bet what people would usually make in a year in the, in the, um, the middle uh, area. Uh, and when he left, uh, I replaced him with a employee that uh, I only had to pay 2,500 bucks a year to. And I was like, wow, <laughs> you were providing a lot of value. <laughs> so, it yeah. just reminded me of that story. Yeah. So re irreplaceable, what your replacement value is. And that's, that's yeah. the problem with having a job is they know they can just find another employee um, or someone younger that they can pay less to. Uh, those of us who are getting the older field where we start seeing, you know, discrimination based upon our gender or not our gender. Well, we see that too as well uh, in, in this economy. Um, but our, uh, our age, you know, yeah. like a lot of my friends are older and uh, good luck getting jobs at you know, these, these hot Silicon Valley uh, startups. I mean, they just, they just don't get hired. There's a yeah. there's serious discrimination there that goes, but you know, one of the things I, I'm sure you guys talk about, and I think this, maybe this is why a lot of people, uh, hold back. I, I, I'll meet a lot of people. They're like, Hey, I'm still working on my business plan. I'm still getting ready to start that business. And you're like, you've been telling me that for like two years. Like, when are you going to just do it? And like, well, when I'm ready. And so maybe people just know they're not ready. They know they're not, they don't have their mental uh, house cleared out. Uh, and, and they're just not in the preparedness. Maybe they're lacking resources, uh, that they can get from your seminar. Um, but uh, I know I see a lot of people doing that. And so it sounds like what you're creating with your webinar is a package where people can go from front to back, clean out their cobwebs and get a plan for the future and where to take it. Absolutely. So I think to a certain extent, you need to, to, to raise your level of awareness. Mm -hmm. So when th that readiness thing, part of it is, it's like, oh, there is a different way, right? You have to educate yourself. You have to expose yourself to new ways of thinking, oh, I was brought up in this bubble and this bubble isn't working, it's not giving me the results I want. So there is like a readiness, like let's, let's get our head right around this. But then there is, Chris, the getting ready to get ready to get ready, to get ready to get ready to get ready, <laughs> to get ready right? Like, and you have to pull the friggin' trigger, okay? Yep. Like one of the key things, I say this over, I, I would assume that you would agree, is one of the key factors for people who are successful is they make quick decisions. Okay? Mm -hmm. They don't overthink things. They don't take five weeks to get on the phone with that person. They call <laughs> them, oh, I need to talk to Joe. Pick up the phone, right? Yeah, it's it like there's, there's like a quick decision like, oh, I need to solve this problem in my business. He's got the solution. I like that. I'm going to buy that, right? It's like, boom, that closes the gap on time, okay? Mm -hmm you start, the, 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 the momentum starts kicking in, okay? So if you're someone who's listening to this thinking, oh my God, that's me, I'm getting ready to get ready to get ready. It's like, <laughs> you do have to like, you have to start acting differently, okay? You, you really do. And, I, and I was, I've actually been guilty of being down at my, being down at the uh, uh, Department of Corporations ready to get the stamp on the corporation and there's no name for the company. And like, I'm literally calling my partners or investors going, you better come up with a name because I'm standing at the freaking window. I'm going to name it X, Y, Z. I'm going to name it some yeah. stupid donuts incorporated if you don't come up with a name. Um, and that's literally where we've been with some of our companies where I had the business model in place. Of course I can do that model in my head. Um, but I, we had the business part, uh, thing in place. We had the offices picked out. We had everything just ready to go. We still didn't have a name for the thing. <laughs> right. And I've seen a lot of people, they put in years to the name. They're like, have you started the business yet? They're like, I'm tr still trying to come up with a good name. I don't know what to name it. You can change the name. <laughs> no, you know? just been, in fact, I think, the, I think the one time that I threw the biggest fit down to the Department of Corporations, I named it, uh, what was it, Ace Mortgage Company? 
And after a month of just getting hell over that name, cause we're in a, we're in a, a state of Utah where they don't gamble. So the term ace, you know, I, I, I thought it was, you know, like an ace, like a flying ace, world war two ace, Yeah. but uh, they didn't like the name. So we, you know, so within 30 days we changed it. Screw it. No one knows the difference. We were all happy and, and everything. <laughs> but you didn't stop. You didn't hold yourself. Yeah. Back. We just kept yeah. rocking. <laughs> we just kept right on going. Cause the name doesn't matter. I mean, it's really going to be rare. I, I don't think I've, have you ever met anybody who's an entrepreneur where they named their company and that was like the everything. I don't think that's even possible Mm-mm. where you name your company, the everything. I mean, I don't think there's anybody, I mean, if you can get a good domain name back in the domain, Brown, maybe you would have a chance. You know, I mean, it's not that, I, I don't want to say that names don't matter, mm-hmm. but like your energy behind it, your business model, your initiative, your momentum, that's going to matter so much more. Mm-hmm. And the name is, is, I mean, it's like good packaging. You need good packaging. Okay. Mm-hmm. It's not nothing, but, and you might want to tweak that, but if you don't get off the ground, like if you don't start, it doesn't matter what your packaging looks like. It doesn't matter what your name is. If you have, if you're not actually got something out there in the marketplace, definitely you're already definitely. at no. Okay. <laughs> kind of thing. So you're giving the seminar, it's called The Freedom Equation, and uh, you've got some ads running. You sent me a copy of one of your ads, which is pretty cool. Oh, what, what's you. the best way people can sign up for this thing and get involved with it? The Freedom Equation. Okay, let me, uh, let me grab that for you. I'm sorry, I don't have it. No, that's no problem. And we'll have a link to the video on the Chris Voss Show where you guys can go check her out. And you can also go to uh, theunstoppablewoman.org, I believe. Yep. So the Freedom Equation training, which is a free training, by the way, it's different from our virtual summit. Mm -hmm. The Freedom Equation training is unstoppablewoman.com slash freedom dash equation. Imagine that freedom dash equation. And you can opt in there and we're doing um, an overview of the Freedom Equation, the steps that it takes to get something from an idea to reality and to really break through on your income and, and, and have economic freedom. And we're, we're walking through what those steps are, laying it out for you. It's really, it's packed with content and teaching. And then if you want to take it further, we have the virtual summit, which is a three day event. There you go. Get out of your own way, increase cash flow, and find freedom. So it should be pretty interesting to go check out. And I know I said org on there. It's, it's actually the unstoppablewoman.com. I had a gentleman. Oh, yeah. I had a gentleman on yesterday who was a dot org. That's why it stuck in my head. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Dot com. Dot com. I remember thinking that I was like, "Org? You really want the org?" And then, I mean, so make sure you yeah. go to the unstoppablewoman dot com and check that out. And uh, anything more we need to know about what you do in the mirror and how to sign up and get involved with it? So no, just do it. So I think you know a couple things here. One, I believe in you right? Everyone has the ability to make as much money as they want and to understand this methodology. I don't think where you came from, um, what your past has been, uh, anything has a limitation on that. If you are willing to step forward and educate yourself and take action on the new information. So I, I really believe that everyone has that ability. Not everyone executes on it, but everyone has that ability. Okay. And if you want to really understand this, I would love to, to have you in my world and, you know, sign up for the free training, come to the summit, uh, listen to my podcast. We, I, that's a teaching podcast, tons of content there. You know, I really believe in this idea of uh, making sure that people have the, the tools available and there's a lot that you can do uh, to get yourself to that next level and ready. And then it's up to you to go for it. Yeah. Awesome sauce. All right. Well, everyone go check it out and uh, uh, go check it. Amira on her website. She's got a lot of great things, a lot of different speaking, consulting stuff that she does and everything else. Uh, thanks to my audience for tuning in. Go to the Chris show.com or the cbpn.com to subscribe to all of our podcasts. You can of course see her uh, previous appearance where we talked about some really cool things and had a lot of fun uh, on the Chris Foss show as well. Um, and uh, thanks Samira for being on the show with us today. Awesome to be here, Chris. Thanks for having me again. 
I'm right. going for number five, though. You, you told going me I for number cape. five? There's a robe? I got yeah, there's a robe. I want the robe or the or cape or, or whatever. The cape? <laughs> yeah, you know, that's a, actually, I like that. I, the cape. Yeah, the, the Chris Voss show cape. Yeah. Um, so there you go. Anyway, guys, we certainly appreciate you guys being here. Be sure to tune in often, and we'll see you next time.